Let's look at some induction examples. This is a really naughty one. So I won't really talk about that one, but there we go. So uh, we've got a coil, and it rotates in a uniform magnetic field. And this coil has two turns, and it induces an EMF of 21 volts. Okay, now the question is, if we increase the rotation speeds, we make it spin faster, in fact, four times faster, what will be the new induced EMF in the coil? I think it helps to remember uh, Faraday's law, which is just induced EMF is equal to minus n times delta phi over delta t. Now we're given the fact that the coil has two turns. Okay, fine. But in the new situation, did we change the number of coils? No. So actually that's irrelevant. That's a piece of information that we actually didn't need. But we do know about the speed. So the speed is going to tell us something. Okay, so uh, here's the good news then. If we know that if it's four times faster, that means it's going to be four times this speed of d delta phi delta t. So that's what we're really saying is that four times faster means you have four times the magnetic flux linkage. Well, what does that mean? Since uh, the induced EMF is proportional to this, that means it'll just be four times the original EMF. Well, that's really simple then. That's just equal to, let's see, just 4 times uh, 21. So let's see, 4 times 2 is 8. 4 times 1 is 4. So that means you just get 84. So that means the induced EMF then, E2, let's just say, is going to be 84. And what are the units? It's volts. And there we go. We're done. So actually, that wasn't so bad, was it? You just had to think about uh, Faraday's law. So here we have another example. We've got a rectangular coil, has an area of 3 times 10 to the minus 2 meters squared, so that means it's 0 0.03, and has 2,000 turns. So this is a coil here with lots and lots of turns. It's placed in a uniform magnetic field of magnitude 73 milliteslas. And now we're told that this coil, it rotates with a constant angular speed, so this whole thing is sort of spinning, and it completes a full rotation after 0 0.08 seconds. All right, and we're told that at point t at, at uh, time t equals zero, the coil is perpendicular to the magnetic field. In other words, um, the magnetic field is you know into the page, for example, and the coil is you know flat. So just the way I've drawn it, for example, like this, it's completely flat. Because remember, you have to imagine this thing at some point it's actually you know straight up and down. It's you know lined up with the uh, magnetic field. In this case, at t equals zero, it's exactly ninety degrees to it. So the question is, at time t equals zero, well, we're told the induced current in A, in this section right here, is moving to the left. So right away, before doing anything else then, I'm just going to try to simplify this and just look at this section A right here. And all I know then is this right here, that this induced current is to the left. Well, remember, though, this whole thing is still sitting in a magnetic field like this right here, right? So I'm going to use which hand rule then? I'm going to use a right hand rule number three. It's the right hand rule number three, because that's going to tell me the force. Uh, so let's just think about, and it's right hand rule because it's a current. So I'm going to take my right hand, and what do I do? I place my fingertips into the page. I'm going to put my thumb to the left, and that means my palm is going to be down. So the force will be down. Okay, so that means it'll actually end up feeling this downwards force. Now, what's interesting about this is at that point, it actually doesn't matter. Downwards force won't really uh, cause it to rotate. Do you notice if it's a little bit up? Uh, like, can you imagine this coil, you know, uh, going a little bit towards you? Well, then that force, okay, that'll make it actually spin, maybe. But so at this point here, it's a little bit boring, but there we go. We've at least figured out the uh, direction of the force. Okay, so in part B now, we're supposed to find the average EMF induced in the coil between t equals 0 and t equals 0 0.04. But remember, like the overall period of this whole thing here was actually 0 0.08 seconds. I've just rewritten some of the facts that we got just so I don't have to keep going back and forth. And I also just copied this image right here. So what's going on here? Well, we have to think about this from t equals 0 to t equals 0 0.04 that's just half a rotation. You notice this is a full rotation, so that means from t equals 0 to t equals 0 0.04, what's happening is it's only going to rotate half of a full turn. Do you notice like it's, it hasn't gone all the way around? It's just gone half. Okay, so we can actually uh, look at the magnetic flux. 
because we're going to need that for induced EMF. Magnetic flux, if you remember the equation for it at least, is BA cos theta, where theta is the angle between the normal of the surface, which is, in this case, straight up and down, and the magnetic field, which is straight up and down. Well, that means then that theta is zero. And if theta is zero degrees, what does that mean? Cosine of zero is just one. Okay, so I'll just maybe write that down. So cos of zero equals one. So that means I can rewrite then my equation for phi. It's just going to be phi equals, whoops, I'll make it nicer. Phi here. Phi equals just B times A. So I'm going to need this piece of information. Now what's going to happen is this. Think about it. It's going to go from this phi of B A, and when it spins halfway around, what happens now? Well, now it's exactly half of a rotation, and that means it's, it's upside down. So that means the flux leakage now is negative BA. So it goes from BA to negative BA. Now maybe let's put it all together here, at least try to. So we're going to need this equation for the EMF. It's going to be minus N times delta phi over uh, delta T. So that means I'm going to need all these pieces, including delta phi. So that means if I want to find that, well, let's actually do that maybe off to the side. Maybe I'll do it in a different color. So I'll say, okay, delta phi, then how am I going to do that? Well, it's going to go from, like I said, BA to negative BA. And a change means you start off at your end point, so BA, and then you subtract from that, you know, the start point, which is plus BA. So you do negative BA minus BA. Well, that just gives you, let's see, it's a minus minus. It gives you a minus 2 BA. So that's interesting. So now I have my change in flux is just going to be negative 2BA. So that means then let's start putting all this together then. So that means now I have epsilon, the induced EMF, is going to be, let's see, minus N, which is 2,000. So I'll put that right there, okay, times, let's see, I've got my delta phi, which is minus 2 times B, which is, let's see, 73 times 10 to the minus 3. So i got to put that in. Whoops, I'll just make a nicer 7 here. 73 times 10 to the minus 3. All that times A, which is 3 times 10 to the minus 2. These are all proper units, so we're okay there. All that divided by, let's see, delta T, which is not 0 0.08. It's actually going to be 0 0.04. That's my total time elapsed. There we go. So I'm just going to do this on a calculator. And away I go. By the way, I can ignore the minuses because uh, minus times a minus is going to be a plus. And let's see here. So I'm going to just put it all into my calculator. Um, so I'll do a fraction. And let's see. So I've got 2,000 times 2 times 73 times 10 to the minus 3. All that times 3 times 10 to the minus 2. All that divided by 0 0.04. I end up with an answer of 219. Now keep in mind, these are units of volts. Now I'm only allowed, let's see, I've got uh, two significant figures, I think is the least that I've got right here. So let's just use two significant figures. So that means my induced EMF then will be approximately equal to, let's see, just two, I'll have to say 220 then. So 220 volts. Now this is not my maximum uh, EMF, remember, because it's actually going to be making this alternating current. No, this is actually just my average EMF. So this is my average. And that's because, you know, this whole thing is actually going, uh, if you looked at it, it's actually going up and down and up and down, just like we've been talking about before. This here would be my EMF. It's actually going up and down and up and down, something like this right here. But we do know that this value right here will be 0 0.08. This value right here is 0 0.04. I know that my average, at least, is 220. So somewhere up here, for example, is 220. Okay. So let's do this last example here. We have a bar magnet. I've tried to draw it in 3D. I don't know if it, you can see this, but I've tried to draw a magnet with a north-south, and it's going to be moving either towards this aluminum ring here or away from it. So one is when it's coming towards it. Two is when it's going away from it. Okay, so at two, you're, you're taking this uh, bar magnet and moving it back. One, you're moving it towards. This little ring right here, it's just a, a little piece of metal. And so that means that current can flow in it one way or the other. But it's free to sort of, it's kind of hanging. It's free to move around. So it can sort of swing back and forth. So there's a multiple choice question is what's going to happen you know, initially when you first move this magnet, you know, towards it? What's going to happen to that ring? Does it move to the left or does it move to the right? And of course, when you move it, away what happens.
So I think it's important to consider Lenz's law. Remember, Lenz's law is all about uh, that the induced EMF will oppose the motion. Okay, so I just want to consider like, you know, this step one right here, what happens? And let's do maybe like a side view. So this one here will be like, this is the ring right here, like this as a side view. And here's this magnet then that's coming towards it. So we've got a north and a south, and it's coming towards it. Okay, so I'll maybe draw it like this here, going towards. Well, what's going to happen then? Uh, remember what uh, Lenz's law says, because uh, remember this thing is able to induce a current one way or the other. Remember, this is a, a ring, so it can go kind of, you know, the current can go one way or the other way through this ring. But it will want to oppose the motion, so that means when it's coming towards it, what does it do? It's going to uh, induce a current such that there's a north here and a south here. Why? Because the north is going to oppose that motion. So that means then it's going to put this north here. And that means that initially then what happens is this north and this north will repel. So that means as it comes towards it, this north then will be repelled by that north, so it'll kind of it'll move a little bit away. It'll move to the left. Okay, and why is it that it moved to the left? Well, because it's repelled. It's repelled by the north here, so it repels it. All right, let's look at number two, though. Now it's the same kind of situation, except uh, this thing is moving away. So I've got my north, south, like this, but this time it's going away. And what's going to happen then? Well, the opposite will happen. So now it's going to basically say, hey, wait, no, come back. So that means it wants to make a south here and a north here. What happens then, so this is what's going to happen, the induced current you know, in the ring uh, is going to oppose the north going away from it, so that means it's going to make a south to the right. And what happens then is initially then that means, hey, isn't a south uh, attracted to a north? So that means initially then it's going to swing a little bit to the right as it's going away. Okay, so the fact that the ring moves a little bit to the right, that's because it's, you know, attracts. It attracts uh, this this magnet, at least, attracts this one. So that means which one of these is the choice? Well, left and then right. So that means the answer must actually be C. Phew. But I think it's important to just, you know, take your time through these things here. Really think through what Lenz's law tells you, right? It tells you it's going to oppose the motion.